Happy New Year, Earthlets. Welcome to the first Thrillcast of 2017. I am Mulchar, your host on this journey through the universe that is 2000 AD. And what a year. It's going to be the 40th anniversary of 2000 AD. Uh, well done to those of you who got tickets for the 40th bash in London in February. Uh, to those of you who missed out, I'm very sorry. We only had limited numbers, but... Uh, should be a fantastic time. Uh, on the future Thrillcast after the event, we're going to be having uh, some interviews uh, uh, with people as well as having video on the uh, 2000 AD YouTube channel. So make sure you go along to youtube.com forward slash 2000 AD online to, uh, to see some of that content after the 11th of February. Um, it's also going to be an amazing year of uh, graphic novel releases and comics, don't they? <laughs> the floppy comics. Um, uh, this month alone, we've got... Uh, um, Cadet Anderson Teenage Kicks, which is available uh, this week. Uh, and also Scarlet Traces Volume 1 by Ian Edgington and Diz Rayley, which is absolutely fantastic. You've got an adaptation of uh, H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, and then you've got the first series of the incredible Scarlet Traces. Definitely one to pick up. Um, don't forget also that in February, we're going to be having our 40th anniversary special issue with uh, some amazing artwork. It's just I've just uh, seen some of it trickling into the inbox uh, in the Nerve Centre. Uh, you've got Jock, Dave Gibbons, Henry Flint. You've got Lauren Bukas and Dale Halverson, who we had on the Thrillcast last year, writing uh, a Durham Red story with artwork by Carl Sesquera. Uh, you've got John Wagner in there. You've got The Return of Zombo by Henry Flint and um, Al Ewing. Um, yeah, it's it's going to be fantastic. You need to pick that up in February from all good news agents uh, digitally and in print from 2018 online. But I could talk about what's happening with the 40th anniversary all episode, but let's not. Let's move on to, uh, well, IDW, the American comic book company, have been uh, publishing their own version of Judge Dredd over the last few years. And last year saw a brand new creative team take it over on Mega City Zero, which is Ulysses Freenas, Dan McDade and Eric Freitas. This is uh, a very different version uh, to uh, to the normal 2000 AD Judge Dredd magazine, uh, Judge Dredd. It's delighted some, it's horrified others, but uh, if you've not seen it on your uh, local comic book store shelf, then uh, you can pick it up in print and also digitally. It's uh, one of the Judge Dredd titles that's available on Comicsology. In this series, there's uh, lots of different themes, uh, things that uh, the the main, uh, the normal Judge Dredd series hasn't necessarily uh, tackled, such as toxic internet culture, uh, the nature of um, violence, order, and anarchy in a very different way to, uh, to 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 how it's normally looked at in Judge Dredd. So it's uh, my absolute pleasure to welcome onto the Thrillcast Ulysses and Eric to talk about their version of Judge Dredd, their vision of his world, and uh, what's coming up in the Judge Dredd annual from IDW in 2017. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Good. All good. Well, thanks very much indeed for uh, for chatting to us all the way across the Atlantic. Um, let's 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 start off uh, with, with, with something straightforward. Um, what was your first experience of uh, 2000 AD? Well, Ulysses, let's start with you. What was your first uh, uh, um, encounter with 2000 AD? I guess uh, my first encounter was probably when Douglas Woke asked me to draw Mega City 2 Friday W, and he sent me the um, the America from 2000 AD, the Judge Dredd story. Mm. And that was, I think that was the first story i read um well i had read some judge dread before that but that was the first one that i read and i was like man this is pretty awesome and from then on i just kind of kept on reading anything douglas would send me and anything i picked up mm. was was it difficult easy to 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 uh, read judge dread i mean was was this really your first proper encounter with the character i think that was my first like be beyond like just reading little things here and there that was my first proper like full the full length story mm. with him as a character that was a uh, uh so no it was I, I thought i really i really enjoyed its satirical take i really liked kind of a you don't really see a, a 
criticisms of democracy itself, <laughs> itself in comics. So I thought that was pretty pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, Eric, what about you? Um, well, for me, I guess it was uh, the day that the law died. Um, that that was kind of the one that did it for me, and, and I think that was just because uh, when I was a kid, I saw the movie, and when I figured out that was the movie was based on, sort of, kind of thing, I kind of uh, gravitated towards it. I read that, and I started, and I, you know, off and on, um, just read it through over the years. You know, obviously read Dark Judges and things like that, and uh, yeah. As, as somebody who didn't uh, necessarily know the the, the 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 strip all that well, um, what was your experience of that? first movie but back in what was it 95 oh i have to be honest i thought it was <laughs> i don't remember if it was the sequel or the um the first movie of a trilogy that i made up in my head with uh, demolition man judge dread and um super mario brothers <laughs> <laughs> those three movies were somehow all together for me and um i and I just didn't tell anyone because I honestly thought that just made perfect sense. And why I need? Why do I need to bring it, it up? It does make perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I would like to see somebody do some kind of bridging comics to explain how you jump from one <laughs> to the other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. With Dennis Hopper, yeah, <laughs> going throughout the whole thing. <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, Ulysses, I mean, you you, you brought up um, Mega City Two there, which is the series that you did with uh, with uh, Doug Walk, who's who's been a, a guest on the on the Thrillcast before. Um, as as the artist on that, um, how did you deal with? I mean, at the time, over thirty five years of of different interpretations, because because. Um, Mega City Two was was quite different. It was quite challenging to people who were used to a certain way of looking at Judge Dredd's world. What were your inspirations for your interpretation of Dredd's world? Um, the Jetsons, actually. <laughs> um, I remember uh, Douglas Wolk. He sent me like a a whole bunch of files, just like Googie architecture and Cal- you know scenes from California, LA, and in my head, I just kept thinking. If any place was like the future of like LA, California, for some reason it just stuck in my head as the Jetsons. It's like kind of Technicolor pastel uh, in the clouds. And I always wonder, like, if the Jetsons are upper class, what's the lower class world look like? <laughs> so, what if you go, if you start descending in the clouds, what do you start seeing? And that would be Mega City too. And and I mean, what 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 did you think about uh, uh, the direction that that Doug uh, took it in? With uh, I mean, for those of our listeners who haven't read it, it was, it was uh, Joe Stred going over to Mega City Two. Um, uh, it, was, it was kind of a uh, alternate timeline or kind of just uh, early take on Dread being in that world because obviously Mega City Two got destroyed in the nineties. Or did it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, I, I really love the City of Courts idea. It's actually an idea that we've kept going in the, the Judge Dredd annual that me and Eric just finished writing. So mm-hmm. there, there are hints of the City of Courts concept in, in the next arc that we have planned. Mm. So the, the, the saga continues. Okay. And... and um... What was what was the feedback like for you on uh, City of Courts? Because obviously uh, the the IDW line um, had been a different creative team for uh, a while by that point, and then mm-hmm. uh, there'd been a couple of sh- uh, short series um, that involved uh, 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 British creators, and then you came along with City of Courts. What what was the feedback that you got? Uh, like from fans or yeah, from yeah from people fans. <laughs> Um, I, I generally keep myself from reading any type of, uh, commentary from fans on the internet. Usually Mm. I'll read a few reviews from, uh, uh, websites that I, I admire, but generally I try not to look because they always just say I draw like a child. So (laughs) (laughs) So I'm just like, thanks a lot guys. So I mean, was was this um what what inspired you to uh, to write rather than draw when it came to Judge Dread Zero? Oh uh, well, we on um, me and Douglas, we had a relationship where we traded ideas the entire time while working on uh, Mega City Two. Uh, uh, so then a- afterwards, I was talking to Denton, who's the editor on the Judge Dread series, 
And he said, hey, you should try pitching for the series. So me and Eric did. Hmm. And uh, had you two worked together before? Yeah, for our whole lives. Okay, okay. And and what what kind of working relationship had you had you built up over that time? How how does it work between you, Eric? Hey, uh, so um, I don't. I guess the real. I guess what you're really asking is, and I'll just answer it. Is we've kind of just been working together since I don't know middle school, high school. Um, we've kind of always wanted to know like. I always tell people I always thought everyone wanted to do creative stuff when they got older. So I was always like, I'm going to start now. And then Ulysses kind of had that same mentality. So we've kind of always been writing, making short movies, drawing for a long time now, 15 plus years. So um, we started writing uh, that kind of just turned into writing Amazing Forest and Gamma for Dark Horse and, uh, you know, Monkey Brain. And then it got Amazing Force got sent to IDW and things like that. So, um, yeah, and I guess the whole process is we, one of us gets an idea, the other one calls the other good one, and uh, we start to argue about the idea, why it's good or bad, and then eventually the idea either starts being written or it doesn't, and uh, that's kind of like how it goes. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's definitely a, an American Idol type of approach where it's right? like, I just don't like it. <laughs> like, Come on, you should tell the other person. So, I mean, how, how did you two meet in the first place? Um, well, I, I always tell the story that we have two very different stories. I was a, you know, red-blooded American kid who thought the only way to make friends with anyone was to be mean. So I saw a kid drawing Ninja Turtles, and I was like, I like Ninja Turtles. I want to be friends with this guy. Let me walk over and, and talk to him. So I probably walked over and said something mean to him. But Ulysses tells the story as if, I was bullying him. Oh, he bullied me. <laughs> so, uh, I guess there's two ways to to look at that. <laughs> it's kind of like the 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 old uh, uh, hokey thing about you know if 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 uh, a boy likes a girl, then then he'll walk over and punch her, kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Except this is a no, romance no. version. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like, you don't. You have to imagine that Eric looked like he was like a grown man when he was like 11 years old, <laughs> and I looked like I was a small defenseless child and he was just like i really like those ninja turtles i was like please stop saying stuff to me yeah and, exactly and i didn't realize how different i was from everyone else because you know my parents always treated me like i was a regular 11 year old so when i started going to school interacting and everyone tried to start started treating me like wow you should be in like a senior in high school uh it, you know it always just made me feel like and realized how it was coming off a lot of the times. <laughs> and and uh, how how has that relationship changed? I mean, is, is uh, does Eric still bully you, Ulysses? Constantly. <laughs> yeah, con now, now, now I just do. Yeah, now oh, I just bully him. Please. Yeah, now, now it's bad. Now I'm really bullying him. <laughs> He's actually, actually not on a separate phone call. He's behind yeah. me right now. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I actually get weirded out when I don't bully him and I drive to his house and just egg his house. <laughs> just to feel better. <laughs> so um, tell, tell us a bit about the, the, uh, the, the, kind of the, the kernel of the idea that became uh, Mega City Zero, which is the, the series that's, uh, that just finished recently. The, the biggest idea we had was, uh, I remember I was, Denton sent me the email saying, hey, you should pitch to... Uh, you know, for Judge Dredd, and it was like maybe like three o'clock in the morning, and I hadn't told Eric yet uh, that we had this opportunity in my head. So I just wrote back to Denton. I was just like, "What if we get rid of Mega City One?" And that was it. <laughs> that was pretty much. <laughs> After that, we figured it out from there. Well, I, you know what I remember? Um, I remember Ulysses kind of explained to me we got this opportunity. He has this idea. And he sent me a link to what the idea was. And I remember being at work, so I just looked at my phone. And all I, the link was was a picture of grass. And, and then I, I was like, and I was like very confused. And I started reading it. And I was like, what, what, is, he, what is he doing? Does he, does he just want like a vegetate? And then I called him and he explained it. And we kind of just like reverse engineered the entire idea from there. Because in in previous interviews I've I've seen with you both, you've uh, been very specific about the idea of taking dread out of what you call his comfort zone, which I guess means you know the the nasty, deadly, mean streets of Mega City One. Oh yeah, that, that was a that was very big for us because you know dread has so much canon to him 
that it's so hard to come to. Um, I, I guess it's just hard as a writer to create a new emotional arc for him, right? Because it's like there's so many things he's been through, so many things you know that are just unlike his character that would go against the grain, that you know, kind of you know that would maybe disrupt the fans or anything like that. So for us, it was like, well, if we can't really do much with dread. Um, maybe we can do a lot with the world he's in, you know, that, that, that surrounds him. And, uh, we kind of just played with that idea and just figured we'll just keep putting him in, you know, as many uncomfortable situations as possible. Mm -hmm. We won't change his demeanor or, you know, his reactions, but you know, the fact that he is dealing with a, maybe a, a small tribe of people who seem to be getting along just fine without law. You know, and even though they don't always do the things he agrees with, it may make him, you know, feel uncomfortable or make him question a few things. But in the end, he's still dread. Yeah. One of the big things we wanted to do is uh, just how do you distinguish the IDW dread from 2000 AD? It's, 2000 AD is still making great, amazing comics with Judge Dredd. So there's always that question of, you know, to put it bluntly, it was like, why does IDW dread exist? And at least for me, it's just how do you how do you tell a different story? How do you not just do like a greatest hits of of better comics that you've read? So I always think that's one of the biggest that was one of the biggest ways we approached uh, Mega City Zero. Mm. Well, I, that, that brings me on to something I, would, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about was um, that uh, you do see some criticism from from fans saying uh, this is too different this is not the dread that we're used to this isn't dread but i i, I guess the 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 point that the uh, you know you're making and i've seen you make in in interviews before is that this isn't meant to be the same dread this is you know a, a very different take on the same it, source material it isn't it's a, and it's as different a take on the source material as the carl urban dread movie is which is significantly different from the comics but still you can still it still resonates. It still reads as a, a great version of Dread. But I wouldn't, you know, I would never. If someone said that the only type of Dread I can get was Carl Urban Dread, I I would feel it was a bit limited, you know. So I think um, anytime you write a character, anytime new writers come to a character, even then the character is not the same, you know. Uh, Steve Ditko's Spider Man is completely different than Dan Slott's Spider Man. They're, they're really not the same character anymore. So I just think. Um, when when you look at like the dread that we're doing, it's not the same dread. It's not supposed to be. Yeah, and uh, another thing to touch on that, it, it, to me, yes, it's not the same dread. But I mean, a lot of it is. It's still his same reactions to things. You know, like we we were very careful to make sure this is to put dread in situations, made him feel uncomfortable. And that was really the only difference. And then he would always react like dread. So when like people kind of say that, I was like, what you really mean is you kind of just want like another procedural cop story where dread figures it out at the end, which I understand. I mean, you know, that's what they want. And, you know, that's just not we felt like we didn't want to get lost in the shuffle. If anything else, we wanted to stand out with our dread, you know, and uh, at least be remembered for something. And we figured getting rid of Mega City One, putting him something completely different would be fun. Yeah. I think the core of Judge Dredd is these bizarre science fiction stories and seeing these just unexpected takes where, you know, like I said, when I first read uh, America, the that satirical take on democracy, that just that, that approach of what, what, what is this dark twist we can put on it? That is, I think, what Dredd is about. And that's the core right there. Mm. Well, it, I mean, it's interesting that, that you've, when you say you, you know you've taken dread out of out of his comfort zone, you very much in, inverted the power dynamic in the in the strip in the um, in Mega City One, uh, in in you know the standard dread world. Yeah. He is representing a system that is on top, that is the one that is punching down. Where all mm -hmm. of a sudden um, he's transported to a world without order, and yeah. all of a sudden. Uh, he's the one being punched, if you want me. You know, he's the one who's well, who's having to struggle well, against even, the system. Well, it's not even a world without order because, you know, um, Dredd has been in that type of situation before. It's really a world without order that doesn't really understand what Dredd's order is. Mm. It, it's, mm. almo it's almost like 
I mean, it's almost like imagine if someone showed up and started telling you, hey, um, no, you can't go on the Internet more than two hours a day. OK, then that's just the way it is from where I'm from. And it's going to be like that now, you know, just a little bit of that, that to it, too. Yeah. And so we kind of have to balance that. We actually had to balance that a lot where it's like we don't want dread to come off too fanatical at times. But we also want to show that there's fanatical elements to the way he operates because of where he's from. But, you know, there's also he is the moral core of the story. So he kind of needs to navigate that emotionally. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely a certain literacy that's needed to understand the law. And what happens when you take that away? When people don't understand what are what is the law? What is the benefits of it? And to the extent that even Judge Dredd gets his mind wiped of what the law is in the in halfway through. So even he's working from, from a blank slate halfway through the story. Yeah, and it's almost like uh, like the word law was a very confusing word for everyone in this world because they never <laughs> heard it before. <laughs> you know, so, so, so how, how does a man who based his entire life on the word law and everything it represents deal with a group of people who are operating just fine but without his beloved law? Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it, are they wrong? Are they right? You know, things like that. And And... One one thing I detected at, 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 at the heart of Mega City Zero, um, and th th there's there's a certain amount of surface level detail about kind of toxic internet culture, about the way that people, uh, uh, the challenges, the way that people behave these days, um, uh, because you know, in many ways, the gloves are off with the internet. You can do whatever you whatever you want. Are you guys making a a, a, a deeper comment about? The changing face of society now, where all of a sudden uh, people are getting a, a, a taste of anarchy. Yeah, I think if you if you want to find the best example of what eight hundred million crazy people are like, you just go on the internet and you can find eight hundred million <laughs> people. You know, so I think it is the like when you're writing dystopia in the eighties or writing dystopia in the nineties. There's a certain idea of what the city is, and that has to change when you're writing about dystopia in 2016 to 2017, where you really do have as many people as a cyberpunk dystopia, dystopic world would be. So I think when you look at like the what the internet's become, when you look at how like disturbing, you, you can find horror stories of something happening to someone because of the internet every single day now. And I think that's very close to when you pick up any, you know, any issue of Judge Dredd, you're just like, wow, that's a really sad story for that person. And somehow they're they're the ones to blame. You know, so I think that that's uh where we drew the parallels. And and with uh uh with the 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 characters of the of the children, I was quite intrigued about how um they change and adapt and evolve over over time. Well, uh, you, I mean, you mentioned that uh, the the dread is the uh, emotional center of the story. What role are the children meant to play in Mega City Zero? Well, um, each of them kind of represent a, a different uh, way of approaching existing. I guess um, Lolo is kind of like you know really blasé, always cracking jokes, doesn't take anything seriously, good or bad, kind of has a dark, dark sense of humor sometimes, but it could also be a light sense of humor. Whereas uh, Quill is, you know, total pessimistic, doesn't hate human beings, doesn't trust them, and uh, kind of enjoys inflicting pain. And then you have Iggy, who, you know, is kind of um, really optimistic and trusts everyone and loves everyone. And, uh, you know, and you can take those, those are just three different versions of, I think those are three different versions of how people enter their internet experience when they're younger and how it all can change them over time. Yeah. I think, it, and, and to bring the, the, like the internet metaphor further, uh, the way Dread and uh, like, uh, learns to deal with these, you know, with these three like feral children is the same, is, is the same way as how the, they approach, the children figure out what the law is. Like he has no literacy for how this world works. And by kind of taking them under his wing, he figures out what the world is like all the same time. Same time they figure out what his world is like. So he ends up, I think like it's, 
what it ends up giving to Judge Dredd is a sort of emotional core of why he should care about these relationships. Because they, you know, they, you know, when he has nothing, when everything else is taken away, what? Why is he enforcing the law? And it has to be about protecting people. Mm. That's a very interesting point because, uh, uh, as as Americans, there are a lot of issues in America at the moment about law enforcement, about uh, what it's there to do, what it is doing, um, whether it is overreaching itself, and the reactions towards the the, the actions of, of of law enforcement. Um, is this something that's that's is this an issue that's raw? Yeah, well, it's like even if you look if you look at the fandom of Judge Dredd, there are a lot of people who are in law enforcement or in military who ha- who look at Judge Dredd not as a a satirical take or a condemnation of power, but as just a power fantasy. And I think there has to you have to take Judge Dredd and really show why is this wrong, even if the character himself is making right decisions. You know. So the entire structure that that empowers him to make these decisions only leads to more and more corruption. Eventually, the the, the Justice Department spreads more injustice than it than it actually fixes. So I think it's like when it when when it, when we approach it with with these t- topics of like police brutality, it's like how do you save the the cop but condemn the the, the police system? Yeah, no. I, I, you kind of nailed it there. I got nothing to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it was, it's been interesting uh, rereading a lot of uh, the, the sort of uh, rebellion era of Dread recently um, when I've been doing features for uh, the Mega Collection, which is a series that's coming out in the UK at the moment. Um, ab- ab- about the difficulty exactly of that, of, of uh, having, uh, you know, this uh, respect for somebody who is principled in that they have a set uh, moral code that they follow um which is you know dread enforcing the law but that law being horrible and repressive and authoritarian and it's it's kind of it's i mean it's something that john wagner has been you know going back and forth over for for almost 40 years now the the first issue of uh of Mega City Zero introduces the Angela Davis block, and if anyone knows who Angela Angela Davis is, she's spoken extensively on the uh, prison industrial complex, on police corruption and you know brutality. And one of her one of her books is uh, "Make Prisons Obsolete." So when the name of the block is the Angela Davis block, and it's pretty much a prison that the the, the entire Mega City One is almost a. a a open air prison that pretty much says exactly what kind of approach we're taking to what the justice department means in in uh judge red's universe and i i think we're living during a time of change and i think people i think there needs to be a lot of discussions about the way things used to be done and the way things need to be done in the future um the old ways are not always the best ways, and sometimes they are, but um, my, my whole thing is there should always, no matter what, be a discussion or an argument about any policy that comes from above. And um, I, I just, I would love, I, I, I love the fact that we kind of open up uh, that discussion with Mega City Zero. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that, that that is one thing that, that I, I did want to, uh, did want to touch on, was that uh, I mean, like I said, Dredd's been going for for very nearly forty years now, um, and in fact, you know, in in in, in a month or so, we're, we're going to be celebrating his fortieth birthday. Um, in that time, there have been various attempts to uh, inject him into the U.S. Uh, uh, comics sphere. Uh, there was, you know, one in the eighties with uh, Eagle Comics, and then Quality Comics. There's been a couple of attempts since. Um, the IDW series uh, is, is you know, st- still going, still doing well. Um, but there's always that topic of discussion. There's always that question. Do Americans, can Americans get a character that is fundamentally a, 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 a parody of 
the system that they that they live in a very british way of looking at the american system i'd be interested what 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 you guys think about that uh i don't think they can and i don't i don't think when when like if you look at uh, american action heroes it's always the the rebel it's always the guy who's slamming down his badge and saying i got to do things my way so there's a, there's always a big disconnect with the way we look at cops and law enforcement people in fiction and the way we look at them in reality and what we expect from them. You know, so any, you know, if we had the concept of a good a cop who's going to buck the system and do what he has to do because it's right, if that person actually was alive and started speaking out about police brutality and in, we'd have him on the news every single day and they'd be calling him, they'd, they'd be making him an outcast and a social pariah. Well, well, they did with uh, that uh, police officer from Baltimore, James Wood. He's uh, spoken extensively on it and he's been pretty much a social pariah in, in the police force because of it. Um, and, you know, to, to touch on that, if you want to see his interviews, you can just uh, look him up. But uh, yeah, and, and honestly, I do feel like the, the, the gag is lost in America. Um, yeah, and I, think, I think Americans look at a character like Judge Dredd and it's too raw of a of a take on it. So I think that's why so many times uh, the people who are fans of Judge Dredd in America like it as a straight take yes. fascism instead of a uh, you know an undercutting of it. And it's like, yes. like no, I actually would prefer if someone just came up and said I am the law and broke broke some noses. And and I have to be honest, like um, obviously I I got into Dredd younger and growing up, I had to learn that was the gag. I, I, growing up as a child, I was like, he's just like Batman, but he takes it way more seriously. <laughs> um, and honestly, and that's how I digested it as a kid. And uh, I had, it was my love for comics growing up in films and stuff like that, and just creative and storytelling that kind of got me to the point where I was like, oh, that's what you were doing? Yeah. I you think the, the reason, I think the reason Americans can't get it is the same reason you see policemen who wear Punisher t-shirts when they're, when they're not working. It's like, wait, you want to kill the criminals? Aren't you? <laughs> Just arrest them and give them over to justice so they get, you know, presumed innocent? It's like, no. How? Just you just go to any cop forum on the internet, and you can find dozens and dozens of accounts that use Punisher symbols, and they want to kill the civilian. It's, yep. it's insane. It's like that is basically the level of of what they can what they expect from when we when we talk about these kind of characters mm, mm. I, I, I wanted to, to touch on some of Ulysses I, I think you said in a, 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 a an interview a little while ago about <clears throat> violence because I think this this links into the issue about dread either being a warning or being a role model um because you said you know violence is a shorthand for conflict resolution uh, oftentimes automatically in comic stories now Dread's violence is not only extreme but deadly most of the time. There's there's relatively few recurring villains uh, in 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 the Dread world. Whereas American comics, your super your standard superhero comics, let's say, are all still about punching. There's very few characters that that, that genuinely use guns. You know, you mentioned the Punisher there. Um, you, you've, even even characters like uh, I guess Cable. Um, in uh, and and Deadpool in the X Men uh, uh, sphere, um, yeah, they they're using a lot of guns, but people aren't necessarily dying. Um, I, I'd, I'd be interested to know what you, why you think that that is, and why you know why why the British kind of have a character that is utterly deadly, but even American characters that are meant to be deadly and carry lots of weapons aren't actually killing people. Well, I think it, uh, we, there's a distance there where I think, and I think it has to do with a lot of comic book writers in the United States where they, you know, to a certain extent come from a life of privilege where they don't encounter actual violence. And I think one of the, one of the problems is violence is, you know, tragic, but oftentimes extremely necessary. And there's that duality of holding that those two ideas in your head of, yes, this is every time it happens, it shouldn't happen but sometimes it really needs to happen is something that I think a lot of when we, when we write these superhero comics, they don't want to wrestle with, they mm -hmm. don't want to wrestle with maybe Batman should have killed the Joker and really actually explore that and not be like, yeah, but never mind at the end of the story. <laughs> that seems to always what happens is when they actually have that story, 
the Batman always has to pull back at the last second because we can't have him actually kill someone who needs to die. Yeah, uh, I, I always, I mean, I, I have two kind of thoughts on this. I mean, in the end, for me, um, I mean, Batman, Superman, these characters are 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 for kids, essentially. I mean, that's a big chunk of their revenue stream. So there's a little bit of that to it here. And, you know, America's really, really cares about the kids and, you know, what they see when they're growing up and what they understand. Um, and I just kind of feel like there's a lot of that going on. But in the end, too, I, I really think that you, you, you don't make a statement on that character's, um, like, bad qualities. You know, if when someone does something wrong, and it's terrible. And if that same person did something, that same thing alive and it's terrible and, you know, they may have been killed for it or they may have been put in jail for a long time or, or, or whatever it is. It, it, it's weird when someone like Batman does let the Joker go over and over and over and over again. And you grow up reading that, you know, it, it does create something interesting within the psyche of uh, comic book readers. I think so. uh, one of the, the problems is whether a person is, as soon as you, you write someone throwing a punch, you know, punching someone in the face, or whether you have that same character shooting someone, there isn't much thematically different. If you punch someone in the face and you've actually been punched in the face, you can die. You know, you could punch someone and, they, and you can kill them with a punch. And if you're a trained, you know, killer or trained ninja. super ninja or like if you're if you're batman and you fought your whole life when you punch a a crook in the face on the street he's most likely gonna suffer he's either gonna be maimed or he's not gonna wake up again he's not gonna be the same yeah if you, if you haven't dealt with the fact that every time someone gets punched they're gonna bleed and they're gonna be different forever after that it's gonna yeah. change their life you know if you if you haven't dealt with uh, being punched as a kid and you're writing stories of being bullied, then you don't know what it's like. And I think when you're, when you're writing superhero comics where everyone's punching everyone, but, but they somehow think that shooting a gun is that much more of a different kind of violence than deciding to go up to someone and punching them in the face, that is where the failure and that's where the disconnect happens, where they're not really actually talking about violence. And, and put it this way too. Uh, even for the characters like Batman, who, get, who seems to get into like back and forth fist fights every night, um, like a typical fighter, boxing or UFC, takes anywhere from three to six months off between fights because their body just can't handle it, and you know, and the damage they inflict. You know, so one thing I've always, I always wish people did more of was let the linger, lingering injuries be part of the canon. You know, like if you're throwing punches without boxing gloves your whole life. You're going to have the most mangled hands in the history of the world. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like wake up every day. Seriously, wake up every day and punch your knee 10 times and see how your hands end up, you know, in, in the end of the week, you know, punch it as hard as you can or punch the wall. That's and that's literally, you know, what you're doing. And you're just kind of like removing that. You're, you're making something that's very painful, like non-existent in a, in a world that people really, you know, at their formative ages are really taking in for the information of, of that they're getting. You know? yeah. The main, the, the big difference when, it, when in, in the mega city zero story is the little girls that he, he, he ends up spending the story with when they actually encounter real violence that costs the life of their little sister. And for judge dread, it's just Tuesday, but for yeah. them, this is a life changing violent event. Mm. They are none of the characters are ever the same after that, except for Judge Dredd. Yeah. That becomes a major source of conflict of when you be become so numb to violence in your life, necessarily because of being a law enforcement individual, and it makes you completely disconnected from the people you're supposed to be protecting. Mm -hmm. Well, it, 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 it's something with, with, um, with Mega City Zero that I, that I did notice was that, that there's, there's a lot of action, but there seemed to be a, a, a tension about dread using violence in the situation. Like uh, he was, he was being faced with very difficult decisions in mm -hmm. an environment that's very different to the one he's normally in. Um, 
and it, it was almost like you guys were going, well, it would be very easy for Dread to to reach for his gun right now and mm-hmm. just and just blaze away at everybody. But that's not the route we're going to go down. He's he's got to think differently in this situation. Yeah, no, I, I think it, all all those decisions are just to to magnify how distant a judge becomes from judgment from from actually dispensing the law and like what is the whole time in the story we keep repeating what is the law for what what is the purpose of this system and ultimately it's for justice it's to actually you know spread some type of moral uh order upon the chaos that that's happening and let, let's talk a little bit about uh, Dan McDade, whose uh, whose artwork is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, has been an absolute revelation on 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 the series. Um, d- d- was 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 he a suggestion that IDW made, or was he somebody that you wanted to work with? Um, it was actually I, I suggested it because I, I worked with him on this comic called Catalyst: Agents of Change, and we it was a a, a three artist story and the whole time i felt so jealous of his arc but i'm just like man <laughs> he's making my part of the story look like garbage he just looked you know miles ahead of what i was drawing and you know uh when we so when we started working on this the the pitch and the script for for mega city zero um i sent it to him and he was like aren't you are you sure that you don't want to draw this it seems like something you would draw i was like that's true because I'm writing it, but it's, it's also that I didn't want it to look like me. I wanted it to be imbued with another characteristic that I couldn't bring to it. And I think Dan McDade, you know, more than, you know, than I could have expected definitely did that. Yeah. And uh, just to add to how great Dan is, there's a lot of times where, you know, she will write a page or a panel and be like, uh, we hope Dan fixes that, and then he does. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, he, he kind of he makes sometimes he makes us look better than we are. So I really appreciate his work. Yeah, halfway through uh, writing it, I didn't. I, I stopped looking at the art until it was all done, just to see. Mm. You know, because you you want to have that bit of a separation when you're when you. I think as a comic book writer, once you're done writing it, once you've sent it to the artist, you really shouldn't be touching it too much. Like that's when they take it over. Um. And to 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 that extent, a lot of times I'm just like I'm just gonna surprise myself and read this as a reader would when it comes in the like when it comes in the our email box. That that must that must be a, a, a <clears throat> I don't know a nice way to make comics that, that that you're being as surprised as the reader is in that kind yeah. of situation. Yeah, it definitely it gives a, an immediacy to the act because he he draws action so well, which is one of his one of the the, the great pluses of, of his um, style. So when I read these action sequences, and that's one of those th- those times where we'll just write like you know, gun shootout. He's shooting people. Page, <laughs> next page, still shooting some people. <laughs> next page, he's shooting people again. You know, he really will elucidate that story right there. Yeah. Um. Let's let's talk uh, uh, about the future because uh, Mega City Zero uh, came to an end uh, the other month, and uh, you guys have just finished writing the the Judge Dread Annual, which is the the next thing for IDW. Uh, Eric, tell tell us a, a little bit about what what we can expect. Oh man, uh, our our goal is to make you cry <laughs> <laughs> in a good way or a bad way. Bad way. We <laughs> we are we had a like a, a come to Jesus moment. We talked really long on the phone about everything we want to do, every like way we want to take the story. And um, by the end of it, I, I just kind of summed it up as like I, I just I just want to cry. I want to make people cry. I want to make people feel bad. I want this to hurt more than um, anything. I want this to hurt as much as some of the most painful comics I've ever read. I want this to be up there in the pain scale emotionally. And uh, I'm not even joking. I'm I'm. I'm gonna make some of you. Can I curse? Yeah, yeah, by all means. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make some of you motherfuckers cry. That's <laughs> our goal. So, so uh, um, without without giving uh, too many spoilers, Ulysses, what 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 kind of uh, is is are we back on the streets of Mega City One for this? Well, just I guess the the biggest hint is it's called Judge Dread, the Blessed Earth. So the curse has been lifted, but there's there's something. There's something worse that comes with the the miracle of curing the planet. Okay, okay, so so, 
uh yeah uh, when 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 the kind of the, the 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 kind of wolf at the door kind of thing has gone away what are the challenges of of you know being a totalitarian system when your reason for existing isn't there anymore kind of thing well that's that, that's a great way of putting it when the wolf at the door is gone and you just got 800 little piggies <laughs> what do you feed them <laughs> what, how do you take care of all these piggies so that's that's the best way of putting it. <laughs> and is is uh, is Dan on artwork or is it somebody different? Dan's on it still. Excellent. Yeah. We're trying to really go the 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 European art market, art comic market, where we're just one you know writer and artist sticking together for as long as we can do it. <laughs> and um, let's just talk about IDW for a second, because uh, obviously the, the 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 series has been going for a while now. You're the second major creative team uh, on on the uh, on the main series. Um, what what are your thoughts on how they've they've uh, curated uh, the, the the license for for Judge Dredd? I think it's like honestly, I wish we could do explore the the Judge Dredd universe more uh, in different stories in uh, with IDW, but. In general, they, we've had such great free reign with these characters, with these universe that I, you know it's one of the. This is our first major writing project as well for me and Eric. Uh, we've had other writing gigs, but generally, uh, I've started in comics as an artist, and now mostly transitioning to a writer. So to have this kind of creative freedom has been, you know, a, a great blessing. In terms of uh, cause 2000 AD is is a very broad church because uh, you know it's not just Judge Dredd. We've got all these other characters as well. Um, uh, 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 have both of you got alternative characters that you that you'd like to have a go at? Is, is there something else from the uh, from the pantheon of characters that uh, that you'd you'd like to write? Eric, uh, well, me, Machine Angel. That well, we, we're writing him in the Blessed Earth. As a uh, well, I guess we'll give it away. Uh, he's he's no longer the mean machine angel. He's a magnanimous machine angel. <laughs> <laughs> so his meter is now to make him nicer. Um, yeah. Um. I, I, I put us. We're figuring out ways to get the characters we want to write in in into Judge Dread. Uh, that's what you're asking. Yeah. In terms of like the broader 2000 AD universe, Denton had a a little plan of kind of doing a. A little bit of a crossover with, like, say, the ABC Warriors. Um, what's the what's the guy's name? Rogue. Uh, oh, Rogue Trooper. Rogue Trooper. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I would love to do that. I think it got <laughs> shot down, though. <laughs> so, uh, so right now we are limited to the borders of Mega City One. Who, who knows? Maybe if we impress them, we'll, we'll get some broader access. And and just to, just to finish off, what's been your favorite moment? Of, of writing dread what was what's, what's been the, the 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 moment where you've you've sort of typed it out on the on the keyboard and thought yeah actually that's that's something i enjoyed writing and i'll enjoy seeing it in in print okay this is gonna sound a little silly especially after talking about such heavy topics as like police brutality uh and violence but i really love adding a beard to judge dread <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's, if, if anyone asks, what's the biggest difference between IDW Dread and 2000 AD Dread, it's say like, ours just has a white beard. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I guess for me, is uh, it's a little darker than that. It was um, when one of the children characters, Lolo, kills her, kills someone um, because of her, her uh, after oh, yeah. dealing with the traumatic event of yeah. her sister dying, she trusts no one anymore. And someone very trustworthy tries to help her. And she just can't trust anyone, and she assumes they're trying to get something out of her, and she kills them. That was a, a heavy moment. <laughs> yeah. he also, so that's also the, the issue where he grew a beard. <laughs> uh, it actually is. Right? <laughs> well, uh, on that wonderful yin yang moment, um, I think we'll, uh, we'll bring it to a close. So thanks again, uh, guys, for for talking. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, I've I've loved seeing the way that your version of uh, Dread has evolved uh, over the past few issues and looking forward to, to, to reading uh, the annual and uh, the, uh, the Blessed Earth. Well, thank you to Eric and to Ulysses for uh, explaining a little bit about their thinking behind their Judge Dread series and its different take on that world. 
I'm afraid that's all we've got time for on the latest 2080 Thrillcast. Join us in two weeks' time when we have a, another very special guest. Not going to uh, reveal who it is just yet, but keep your eyes peeled to our social media and also the 2080 Thrill Mail. Uh, if you've not joined up to the Thrill Mail, what are you doing? www.2080online.com forward slash thrill mail weekly thrillgasm in your inbox and you'll get all the latest news about the galaxy's greatest comic until then earthlets splendid birth ring alert 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 thrill power levels dangerously high alert alert the 2000 AD every week ask your comic book store or news agent now Subscribe to the galaxy's greatest comic at 2080online.com. Subscribe digitally on our apps for Apple, Android, and Windows 10. And download the RM free copies from 2080online.com. Alert! Alert! Stand by for urgent updates. Search for 2080 on Twitter and Facebook. Watch the latest videos at youtube.com forward slash 2080 online and follow on Instagram at insta 2080 program complete shutting down